We are privileged today to have Dr. Malcolm Yarnell and his wife, Karen, with us. <clears throat> the connection with Dr. Yarnell, who is the research professor of theology at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas, so that's a, a long expression, um, is that his wife, Karen, and my wife, Christina, were college roommates at the University of North Texas, and we've made this connection along the way. Dr. Uh, Yarnell um, has a PhD from Oxford and a master's degree in theology or something like that from Duke, as well as a master's of divinity degree from, um, from Southwestern Seminary. And they have five children and two grandkids and another one on the way. And Dr. Yarnell has been gracious enough to be with us all weekend, um, just helping us develop and live out a biblical worldview as the salt of the earth and of the light, as of the light of the world. So grateful to have him with us. I wanted to just offer a brief prayer and then turn it over to him so that he can have as much time as possible as a part of our journey. God, thank you that you're always speaking to your church. God, thank you that you've raised up people to communicate that message as they teach the scriptures. So, Father, I pray in these moments we'd have ears to hear and eyes to see what you're saying to us today. As we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, welcome. Glad to have you with Thank us. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. So uh, Karen and I are from Texas, and if you need a translation, both uh, uh, Christina and Neil have spent time in Texas, and so they can, they can translate any difficult uh, Texasisms that I might throw out at you. So no, really, I was actually born in New York, lived in Maine, lived in lots of places because my father was in the U.S. Air Force. So um, this message brings together uh, all of what we were discussing in the last two days in the Way of Life seminar. Now, you don't have to have attended that seminar in order to understand this message, but those of you that did attend, uh, you will recognize a, a great deal of what we're saying for those of you that did not attend, uh, I understand that it was recorded and that will be available uh, to you through a, uh, a closed uh, YouTube uh, link and the church will be glad to provide that for you. So how do we bring all of this together? What is the way of life that we should live? This is our question. How do we exist in, as Christians, how do we exist in a culture that is not exactly like the church, if you haven't figured that out. So our purpose today, and, and I just want to set it out for you, our purpose today is spelled out by Paul in his uh, first letter to Timothy. In chapter 1, verse 5, he says, Now the goal of our instruction, so this is our goal today, our purpose, the goal of our instruction is love that comes from a pure heart a good conscience, and a sincere faith. So love describes our actions. Love is from God. God himself, his very being is love. And he loved us, and because he has loved us by giving his son to die on the cross for our sins and to rise from the dead so that whoever believes in him can be justified, he also calls us to love him back. And so we that's one of the two great commandments. Uh, the greatest commandment, according to Jesus, is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And the second is like unto it, and that is to love your neighbor as yourself. And of course, who is your neighbor? Well, actually, your neighbor is any other human being on this planet. Uh, he or she, no matter how old they are, no matter what their education, their ethnicity, whatever, they are your neighbor. And we are to love one another in that way. But this love that we ought to have is not generated from within ourselves. It comes from God. And that's why he talks about the origin of our actions of love. They ought to come out of a pure heart, a good conscience, a sincere faith. And a pure heart is created in you not naturally, because we're all fallen, we're all sinners, and our hearts are corrupted, but the Holy Spirit can take and to cleanse your heart and to remove the sin from you, to take the guilt away uh, through uh, giving you faith in the Son, Jesus Christ. It is God who can take your guilty conscience 
and turn it into a good conscience. Uh, so it is a work of the Holy Spirit. It is a work of God the Father. And of course, it is also a work of the Son, Jesus Christ. This is the pure faith. A pure faith is to have faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I know I emphasize that, but I want to emphasize it again. It is faith in Jesus Christ. It is not faith in the church, although it is his body. It is not faith in people around us, although we ought to treat them with dignity. It is faith in a particular person, the only one who can help us, and that is Jesus Christ. And so if you have a pure heart, if you have a good conscience with God, and if you have a sincere faith, then love will come naturally flowing through you to other people. Now, not everyone, mind you, has the same purpose. In the verses immediately preceding Paul's statement about his purpose, he pointed out the purposes and ways of false teachers and errant hearers. Uh, he writes this, As I urged you when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, and this is his message to Timothy, so he told him, you have to stay in Ephesus. Ephesus was like the, uh, the New York City or the Boston of that day. It was a, a center of culture, of trade, of uh, many peoples coming together, and uh, Timothy's job was to stay there and to work. Remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain people. Now, later he actually names them, and you can read the first letter to Timothy if you want their names. You may instruct certain people not to teach false doctrine or to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies. You know, there are a lot of myths and endless genealogies out there. And Christian teachers, true Christian teachers, will put those aside and they'll say, no, we're going to focus on the Word of God. We're going to focus on Jesus Christ. We're going to focus on the free gift of salvation. But those myths and those endless genealogies promote empty speculations rather than God's plan, which operates by faith. What is God's plan? Well, God's plan is that He has sent His only begotten Son. The eternal Word of God has become a human being, born of the Virgin Mary, become one of us. He has lived among us. He has uh, been tempted in all ways that we are tempted, yet without sinning. And then he died on the cross. But not only did he die on the cross, he arose from the dead so that whoever believes in him, we heard from John 3.16 this morning, whosoever will believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. And that's what God's plan is. Many of us want to know, what is God doing? I see all sorts of things going on in this world. What is God doing? What is His plan? His plan is to save us from our failures. His plan is Jesus Christ, the incarnate God. So, I'd like to look at our primary text today. That's our purpose. Just wanted to tell you why I'm here, what I'm doing. Uh, but our primary text today is going to be found in the next chapter, and there are six verses, and I'd like us to look at them together. We'll break them into three parts, but let's read the text first of all. And first of all, then, I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all a testimony at the proper time. So this is our text, and I pray the Lord will, by His Spirit, open our hearts and minds and illumine to us what He has inspired the Apostle to write. Here's our outline. We're going to look at the first two verses, which concern our many prayers. Verses 1 through 2. Verses 3 through 4 concern who God is, and He is a good God. And then our third point regards 
Jesus Christ, who is our one mediator. And that will be found in verses 5 through 6. A very easy text to divide and to begin to get an understanding of, but there's so much in here, and I hope that the Lord will help you and me to incorporate this text into our hearts. Well, number one, our many prayers. First of all, then, he wrote, I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. So I think we can look at this uh, text and say there, it concerns our types of prayers and our objects of prayers. You know, how do we pray and for what ought we to pray? Well, the types of our prayers are divided into four according to Paul here. He talks about petitions. That means requests. When you need something and you don't have access to yourself, you make a request. And when we take and bring to God what we need, those are our requests. And we ought to be helping one another. Uh, We ought to be asking, what is your petition for the Lord? I mean, perhaps you might ask someone who's an acquaintance. You know, I'm in the midst of my prayers. What can I pray for you about? And you'd be surprised how people have these deep longings and needs, and they want someone to petition for them. They might not even be a believer, but they know they need help, and perhaps that might be an opportunity for you to hear about what's going on in their lives so that you can love them. So take their petitions and and, and, and notice this. I believe, because I've seen it so much, and Scripture verifies this, God delights to answer His children's prayers. And so He wants to take your prayers, He wants to take your requests, and He wants to answer them. So, ask God. You have not because you ask not, Jesus said. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened to you. The next term, prayers, that's more of a general term, and it reminds us of when Paul said that we must pray without ceasing. Actually, prayer and praying needs to be a regular part of our lives. So whatever you're doing, wherever you are, no matter what time of day or night, well, maybe if you're sleeping, you're not exactly praying, but maybe you do wake up in prayer. I know I did in the middle of the night last night. But pray without ceasing. Let it be a general movement of our lives to have that communion with God to say, Lord, I'm having trouble here. Help me to do well. Help me to love others where I have difficulty loving others. Help me to forgive where I have difficulty forgiving. The third, intercessions. An intercessor is a person who says, you know, I need to go to God for this person. And believers must stand in for people who cannot or are not able to make requests of God for themselves. Over the last uh, several weeks, I've had uh, people share with me deep, critical needs that they had, and they just felt a sense of loss. And you know what I did for them? The best thing I could do for them was not try to answer everything for them. I don't have all the answers. I don't know all the answers. But I know the God who has all the answers. And just to stop and say, well, can I pray with you for this loved one? And to know the peace of God that comes over someone's heart because they have taken that issue and laid it before the Lord, that's called intercession. And we need to do that with one another. Now, notice, an intercessor and a mediator are are closely related, but they're not actually the same thing. In this text, we read that there is only one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. So you and I can't mediate. I can't take away someone's sins. I I can't do that. But I can pray that the Lord will give His Spirit to move in a person's heart so that this person can have faith and trust in God and have their sins taken away through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's what an intercessor can do. And finally, thanksgivings. You know, there are times where God does great things for us and we're like, whew, I'm glad that's settled and we move on. But Jesus talked about how, or or the uh, gospel tells us that Jesus 
killed ten lepers. <laughs> and only one of them came back and said thank you. That's, that ought to convict us. If we're not thanking God for all of the good gifts in life, we're not engaging in prayer as we should. So give thanksgivings. And, and who should be the objects of our prayers? Now, sometimes we have kind of selfish prayers and we pray about things, you know. Lord, I want a girlfriend, right? I, I prayed that when I was young. He gave me Karen. I'm thankful for that. But, I, 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 you know, Lord, I'd like my car to be better than it has been, you know, and I'm, I'm tired of driving being the oldest car among all my friends, you know, uh, or even having a car. So sometimes, and we need those things, and we ought to pray to the Lord to, for those things, but really the objects of our prayers need to be people. Those who are the most priceless objects upon this earth are those who are made in the image of God, and they are precious. And so let us pray. Pray for everyone. So it doesn't matter this person's relationship to you, though you should especially pray for your family, your friends, your church. Uh, yes, pray, but pray for everyone. And pray, he says, for the leaders of our society, for kings and all those who are in authority. Now, the early Christians were persecuted by evil kings and emperors like Nero. Nero actually burned Christians on crosses at night to light the city of Rome. That's how evil that man was. And Paul says, and, and Paul, we believe, may have been writing this about the time of Nero, when Christians had already been suffering. It would have been difficult for those early Christians to love Nero enough to pray for Nero, and yet Paul says, pray for Nero. So, with that in mind, if you are a Republican, it is not too difficult to pray for a Democrat president. And if you are a Democrat, it is not too difficult to pray for a Republican Speaker of the House. Because none of them are burning us at the stake. Really, let us be convicted that whatever your politics, pray for those who are in authority. And pray that God will bless them, especially with a knowledge of himself. The scripture tells us that the heart of the king is in the hand of God, and he will move it wherever he will. So if we want God to do a great work in our society, let us pray that God will work among our authorities. And he will do so. The word commands us to. It's not an option for believers. We must pray for our rulers. And then pray in a, for a specific reason as you pray for everyone, as you especially pray for the kings and those in authority. Pray that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Pray for your own lives, for our lives. You know, peace and safety, that tranquil and quiet life, that was actually a motto of the Roman Empire. They wanted to have peace and safety. Now, they did it by conquering and abusing and enslaving other people. But all of us need peace and safety. And Paul's saying, you know, like the Romans, we should pray for peace and safety. But we should ask God, in particular, to give us the same unmolested lives as the Roman rulers. That's his context. And why? So that we can conduct our lives in godliness and dignity. Now, godliness and dignity, as you're already telling, was not the characteristic of the lives of the Roman rulers. But we can pray that we can have godliness and dignity in a context that will enable us to live in such a way that people will say, you know, these are godly people. They're different. They don't act in the same way as the evil people we see around us. They're godly, and, and they treat others with dignity. The Romans didn't treat other people with dignity, but Christians must treat other people with dignity, even when we disagree with them, and, and be godly. Do you know that for Peter, for Paul, for all of the uh, early disciples, the, they had learned from Jesus that if we call Jesus Lord, then he needs to be the Lord of our lives. And we need to live godly lives as best we can. 
Well, so that is about the prayer. But let's look also at the next two verses. Our good God. This is good, Paul writes, in verse 3, and and it pleases God our Savior, and the verse 4 begins, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This is good, and this is God's will. So let's talk about the goodness of God and the will of God. The goodness of God. God himself is goodness. That's his very nature. For Thomas Aquinas, the great medieval theologian, and for John Gill, the the first great particular Baptist theologian, the goodness of God was the primary attribute of God. And anything that we can say about what it is to be good is to be gotten from God. For he in his perfection is the very definition of goodness. It's the same with his holiness and his love and his righteousness. If you want to know what these things are in their perfection, you have to look at God. You can't look at us. Because we, we participate, we receive these things from God, but because we're sinners, we mess these things up. So don't get your ideas of what is just from humanity Get it from God's revelation of how just He is. And know that whatever He does is always just. And whatever He does is always good. And whatever He does is always love. All His actions are good. We may not always understand what He's doing, but He always acts in the best way. Job, you'll remember, he was suffering. But he ended up saying, and I think rightly, Though he slay me, yet will I serve him. Yet will I trust him. This this is the type of knowledge that we ought to have about God, that whatever's going on in this life, genocide, abuse, whatever's going on, we know that God is in control and that he will work all things to the best for those who love him, according to Paul in the book of Romans. And his will, understand, is always good. We sometimes doubt his good because we view him as if he were directing us like we were machines and as if he would just wipe away and not treat us with the dignity that he has given us. He made us in his image, and part of that means that he created us with wills. And he lets us do what we're going to do. And he wants to direct our wills toward him, but he does it gently by pulling us with bonds of love, Scripture says. And so God is not a God who directs us like we're a bunch of machines. He treats us as persons because He made us in His image. He grants us a certain measure of freedom because He Himself is the God who is free. What is the will of God? The will of God and the goodness of God are not in contradiction to one another. Uh, Tommy Lee said it this way, the will of God does not function as a ruthless bulldozer crushing and forcing into obedience any who resist it. God urges us to repentance with his goodness rather than coercing us toward the truth by the application of naked power. God treats us with dignity, doesn't he? We ought to treat one another with dignity. And I want you to notice this. What is the will of God? The will of God, he actually wants everyone to be saved. He really does. Now, he gives us our freedom, but he wants everyone to be saved, and he wants everyone to come to the knowledge of the truth. And God wants those of us who are believers to join him in extending the offer of salvation to everyone to come to know Christ. Tommy Lee again says this, in suggesting a broad extent for the death of Christ, Paul was taking issue with the idea that only the spiritually elite are the beneficiaries of Christ's death. Christ died for everyone, but only those who trust in him will be saved. But it's available. That salvation is available to everyone. And he wants everyone to be saved. And let's remember that we have one mediator. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. Notice this, there's only one God, for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus. 
Uh, my students will tell you uh, at seminary and in my church, I have a passion for Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's my Savior. And we must honor him. And we must honor him because he is our only mediator. And more than that, he is our God. For there is one God and one mediator. Uh, and notice the biblical passages which were written before this, which help explain this. Note how God is one and the mediator, Christ, is one with God. Uh, Paul wrote earlier in a letter to Corinth, Yet for us there is one God, the Father. All things are from Him and we exist for Him. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ. All things are through Him and we exist through Him. And in the Old Testament, He was known as the Lord God. The book of Deuteronomy says it this way, Listen Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And there's only one mediator. There's only one who can take and reconcile us with God. And that is one who is one with God and one with us. And only Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. Jesus warned us that there would come false Christs and false prophets who would try to lead us astray. And these false mediators try to lead us astray by pointing us to some hope other than salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. And they diminish Christ in some way. They distort his person, his deity, or his humanity. And the false Christs or wolves among these false teachers and hirelings are typically driven by the desire to usurp the place of Jesus Christ as the Lord of his people. In ancient times, they were known as Gnostics and Arians and Markelians and Nestorians and Eutychians. And today they have different names. Oh, but they're around. You know, our focus as true believers in Jesus Christ must remain upon that one mediator, Jesus Christ, and upon no other. And what is he doing for us as our mediator? Well, he is our ransom. The Greek term in the text here is antilutron, and it indicates a price that has been paid in the market to buy a person back from slavery. Do you realize that when you sin against God, you have sold your slave self in slavery to sin, death, and the devil? And what Christ did on the cross is he paid the price for your sin. God has taken and laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Why? So that in a commercial transaction, if you will, this is a metaphor, a ransom, he has gone into the marketplace and bought us back from our sin. And the price for it was the blood of Jesus Christ. J.N.D. Kelly says it this way, It is the fact that Christ died for all men without any kind of favoritism, and that makes it obligatory for Christians to pray for them all without distinction. Do you realize that if you have become a believer in Jesus Christ, then you have been bought back from sin, and not by anything you've done. It's been all done for you by Jesus Christ. And if that's the case, that means God loves you, and you in turn ought to love other people with the same love that he has loved you. This is the way of life in this world that is so difficult and so sinful. We ought to be out there bearing testimony is the language that Paul uses. That means to witness. That means to speak to. That means to say, listen, let me give you my testifying. I am testifying to you that God has saved me from my sin. And I no longer am guilty. And would you come and receive the same forgiveness that I have? But of course, this testimony must be believed if a person wants to be saved. And that's my question for you even now, is do you have that knowledge in Jesus Christ that you have been born again? Do you know for sure that your sins have been taken away? If not, I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and I hope that you will pray and ask God to remove your sin. And if you're a believer I hope you'll be praying for people around you, and I hope you will be praying for people to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ.
Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Father, we thank you for the opportunity to hear your word. And we pray, Lord, that even now uh, you will take and change our hearts. Lord, convict us. My brother, my sister in humanity, if you do not know the Lord as your Savior, just simply call out to him. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I trust in your son. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he arose from the dead so that I could have eternal life. I just want to trust him. I want to follow him. If you do that, there's cards in front of you, in front of your seat. Would you fill that out or seek out uh, one of the pastors or other uh, mature believers around you and let them know and they'll help you. And believers... Would you bear testimony to the entire world that Jesus Christ is the good God who became a man and who invites us to live with him forever? Father, we thank you for this time together. We pray these things in Jesus' name.